uh, and uh, get rid of all those classical attacks that were happening uh, before this uh, standard came in came. All right. So now what we are going to look at is like firewalls and intrusion detection systems. So this is like the last topic of this module. So let us f begin with firewalls. So this is another kind of way of trying to provide network security. Now, if you have heard of what is called a firewall, you might have heard of like a firewall is like a hardware uh, running on a network. But firewall is not really a hardware, it's like a software. It's an application, uh, software running on a dedicated computer, host computer. So that means uh, you should not run any other application on that computer. So that's why some people think it like a hardware, but it's nearly not a hardware, it is like an application running on a computer. Now why we do not run any other application on that computer is, uh, as I said some time back, each application, like say uh, if you're hosting a website or if you're hosting a database server or something, will have some kind of vulnerability. So you don't want an attacker to exploit the vulnerabilities of those applications running on the comp same computer in which you're hosting your firewall. So if the attacker manages to exploit the vulnerabilities of those applications, they gain control of that machine, which means they can also control the firewall. So we don't want that to happen. So that, that is why a firewall application is running on a dedicated computer in, on which no other application is running. Now, also as I state here, a firewall is as good as how it is configured. So a firewall typically functions based on a set of rules. And uh, so you need to be able to configure or make the firewall to be able to know what is good and what is bad and then drop the bad information and allow only the good information to enter the network. Or a firewall can also be used to monitor what is leaving the network. So in that sense, we can have what is called egress filtering and ingress filtering. So if a firewall is filtering traffic that goes outside the network, it is said to be doing what is called egress filtering. And if a firewall filters traffic based on what is incoming uh, to the network, it's called ingress filtering. So typically firewall will do both. Okay. And what kind of traffic to allow and not allow is typically identified using the source and destination IP address or the network address of the source and destination as well as the port numbers of the source and destination application. So these are the typical uh, field values that are used by a firewall to decide whether to allow a traffic or not. Now, uh, also when it comes to design strategy of a firewall, we can have two typical design strategies called a default deny approach and a default allow approach. So it's also called a whitelist and blacklist approach. So when I say something like a whitelist, it means it's like a list of good things that you want to allow inside. So uh, you may specify, okay, uh, allow packets coming from a particular uh, network, network address or allow all packets belonging to say the FTP application or a web application by indicating the port number as part of the rules. So if an incoming traffic doesn't correspond to any of those things listed in the whitelist, then it is kind of just dropped. So that's why it's called default deny approach. Okay. Now the blacklist approach is uh, you have the firewall to know about what are the bad things uh, that should not be allowed and if anything that is supposed to be allowed doesn't uh, conform to any of those uh, blacklisted things then uh, you allow the traffic so it's called the default allow approach of course each one has uh, an advantage and disadvantage in the default deny approach it's kind of very uh, uh, restrictive in the sense that uh, you are allowing only things that are stated explicitly as good things. There may be some new traffic coming from a new source network or new IP address uh, which is not listed in that whitelist. So that me in that case you will just drop that traffic, right? So uh, it could uh, lead to a lot of packet drop. But uh, uh, you also will be able to do a lot of protection because you allow only the good things that you consider to be really good. So uh, your network is less vulnerable to an attack, but there will be, could be a lot of packet drops. 
on the other hand if you use the default allow approach as the name itself indicates you are allowing you are only dropping uh, only those things that are explicitly listed to be dropped okay and uh, so if uh, if an attack traffic originates from a source uh, who, which is not blacklisted then you are going to allow that traffic so this will uh, make the network to be more vulnerable for an attack but you will have less packet drops so that's a trade off between using these two approaches so typically you could use a hybrid of both these approaches you don't really use one of these two approaches in the pure sense you use a hybrid of the two now we are going to see uh, three uh, categories of firewalls uh, with increasing complexity so the first one is called a packet filter firewall and then we we'll look at what is called a stateful firewall and then uh, application firewall now in a broad sense we can uh, say the packet filter and the next one the stateful uh, firewall will look at only the headers in the uh, packet so they will look at the these three headers typically especially the addresses the mac address and the link layer uh, um, uh, mac address of the source and destination or the ip address of the source and destination as well as the port numbers of the two uh, sending, sending and receiving application now uh, the application firewall will look at uh, also the data along with the headers so basically look at everything now between the packet filters and the stateful firewall which look only at the headers the difference is the packet filter is stateless as the name for the other stateful means uh, it will maintain some state information between the two entities that were communicating between say the source and destination whereas the packet filter is stateless means it will uh, process things on a per packet basis that means it won't maintain any state information about the packets that are being forwarded or dropped so it will process each packet as independent packet so it will it is very restrictive it goes only by the rules okay if if so it has a set of rules and if uh, that say the ip address of the source network or the destination network uh, uh, is stated as something that can be allowed it will allow packets coming from those network or go into that network if uh, if say the port number or ip address is supposed to be blocked then it will drop those packets okay and so the decision taken for a packet is independent of the decision taken for the preceding packets so why this is important uh, to be considered because uh, there are several attacks like the session hijacking attack we saw and even the um, what is called the sin flooding attack where the attacker could flood a server with a lot of sin request messages to establish TCP connections and so on. So uh, the, uh, in the in the case of say the sin request sin flooding uh, uh, attack uh, I said the solution would be to uh, to see how many sin request messages are coming to a particular server so that means you need to keep track of the number of sin request messages that you have forwarded so far to that particular server uh, so if you do not maintain the state information that means the decision taken you take on one packet is independent of what you have taken on the other packets then every sin request message will appear to be genuine so you will keep forwarding them inside so that's why you cannot prevent such attack with the packet filter firewall and you would need a stateful inspection firewall to do that because a stateful firewall will keep track of how many sin request messages have come to a server that is in the network the firewall is uh, trying to do, give some protection so if the firewall has seen the threshold number of sin request messages coming for a particular server it will block every other sin request message that comes for that server Okay, so that way, that, that way you can prevent the flooding of those sync request messages. Whereas the stateful firewall, even though it is meant to provide protection for the, net, uh, for the servers running inside the network, it will operate on a per packet basis. So it cannot really do such monitoring. But one good thing with the packet filter firewall is, 
uh, it's going to be very fast in handling the packets because it goes only by the rules and a lot of machine learning algorithms and neural network techniques and all artificial intelligence techniques that can be incorporated to a packet filter firewall to speed up the processing time. Uh, um, so, and since it, uh, it does not require to maintain state information, uh, uh, there's no, less, very less overhead in operating a packet filter firewall. Okay? But of course, the drawback is you will end up allowing all such attack packets like the synflet packets, even session hijacking packets and so on. Okay, so uh, this is something I already mentioned. So you could configure the packet filter firewall to block some particular networks or block some particular port number. So Telnet is an application, so you are running on a particular port number. So you can make the packet filter firewall to block all packets with uh, telnet uh, for as the port number. Now you could also prevent spoofing to a certain extent in the sense that say this is say the network uh, for which you are running this firewall uh, and has this prefix 100.50.25. So if someone does IP spoofing from a remote network and they are sending a packet that appears to have originated from 100.50.25 then it's very clear for this firewall that that is IP spoofing because uh, the message appears to come from a network that you are trying to really uh, give protection. So that is not possible. The, uh, so nobody outside this network would have generated that message. right? So that's why you could uh, block such packets that appear to be IP spoofed. So these are some of the attacks that uh, a firewall could give protection for the network it is uh, trying to uh, cover. So the spoofing attack which I just mentioned and source routing attack. Now uh, I think when, when I talk about IP header I mentioned the options field which could be used to enter uh, what are the intermediate networks through which the packet needs to be forwarded. Now it was uh, used in the beginning, earlier days of all this IP header, but now due to security issues, you don't want uh, the source to infer to to control what route the packet to take should take. So when a firewall sees a packet with the source routing information entered the IP header, then the packet filter firewall could simply drop such packets. Now another uh, kind of attacks that the packet filter firewall could uh, try to uh, find out is what is called a tiny fragment attack. So remember when you saw the fragmentation uh, topic, I said, uh, so in fragmentation you basically, uh, let me take a header here, uh, datagram, okay this is a good thing to have. Okay. So when you do fragmentation, I said, uh, so this is one datagram that is supposed to be now fragmented to two or more fragments, but the TCP header goes typically with the first fragment. And of course some payload could be, data portion could also be added to the first fragment. So uh, the TCP header is there only the first fragment and the rest of the fragment will have just the data. Now, of course, the TCP header, you know, has a lot of field information, including a source port number and destination port number. So some firewalls, uh, as I said, will operate based on port numbers. So an attacker could cleverly decide the size of a fragment in such a way that even the TCP header could be fragmented in a way that the source port number goes with one fragment and the destination port number goes with the other fragment. So if a firewall operates based on a combination, if it sees packet coming from a particular source port number going to a particular destination port number, let us say the firewall is supposed to drop that packet. Now if, as again, uh, the packet filter processes things on a case by case basis, packet per packet basis, uh, it won't remember the independent fragments it has seen because again each fragment is an independent packet. So if it sees only the source port number in a fragment and not the destination port number, uh, it thinks it's a tiny fragment in the sense that it is expecting to see the entire TCP header in a fragment or if not uh, no TCP header. So if it sees only a part of the TCP header, 
then it's called a, considered a tiny fragment and it will drop such packets because that is a way of for the attacker to mislead the firewall uh, not to drop the packet so the attacker will split that information we include the source port number in one fragment and try to include the destination port number in another fragment and uh, if the uh, packet filter firewall sees such packets where the TCP header itself is fragmented it will discard all those fragments so that's called the tiny fragment attack and that could be detected by uh, packet filter firewall okay now the state full firewall will again as I said will maintain some state information but still based on the header information it won't look at the data so we talked about a sin flood attack where the state full firewall can maintain information about the number of sin, sin request messages that are just come for a particular server and if it is exceeding a threshold it will drop such packets now the session hijacking attack, we saw the TCP session hijacking attack where I said uh, in order to hijack a session, the attacker should know six field values which are the source IP address, destination IP address, the source port number and the destination port number as well as the expected sequence number at each site. The IP address and port numbers are easy to find out but it's very difficult for an attacker to find out the next expected sequence number at each site. So, uh, uh, at that time I said a typical way an attacker will do is do a trial and error process of trying to send packets with different sequence numbers and see when the receiver destination starts to send the acknowledgement packets uh, to the sender back. So uh, in order to do this the attacker has to really send a lot of dummy packets with uh, different sequence numbers before the destination can synchronize with the attacker. So if the firewall at the destination site sees a lot of such packets coming with arbitrary sequence numbers. So in order to uh, handle this, the firewall should also be following this session between the source and destination. So like the destination keeps track of what is the next expected sequence number from the source, uh, the firewall should also keep track of what is the next expected uh, uh, sequence number from the source. So if it is seeing a lot of packets coming from the source to the destination as part of the TCP session with arbitrary sequence numbers that do not conform with the expect next expected sequence number, then after the firewall sees a certain number, of, because some packets should, could still come out of order, the genuine packets, but that's why you again have to have a threshold. If the firewall uh, sees uh, beyond the threshold number of packets coming out of order with different sequence numbers, that's a confirmation that the uh, uh, somebody is trying to hijack the session rather than the sender trying to send the actual packets. So the, attack, the firewall could start dropping such arbitrary sequence the packets there. Of course, it will lead the TCP session to be closed. Uh, but at least the attack uh, is prevented. So uh, that's how this is done. Now, you could also use a state 4 firewall to uh, make sure uh, your network bandwidth is not exhausted. So you could have seen this, like if you're downloading some movies uh, from the movie databases sites, uh, you might see a message that, okay, you have used uh, the bandwidth allowed for today. You have to wait for, say, 24 hours before you can continue your downloading process. So all these things are done by the stateful firewall so it will keep track of how much bandwidth bytes have been sent to a particular source network or source IP address. If more than a threshold number of bytes have been downloaded from a particular source IP, uh, or sent to a particular source IP address then uh, the uh, uh, firewall will drop all such outgoing bytes beyond a threshold. Now also if you want to uh, you know control the ping request messages so I said the ping message is used to find out which server is alive which is uh, running or not so you can uh, ping a particular server running in a remote network but this could be again misused we saw some flooding based attacks with the echo request process in the classical attack category. So the firewall is running at again at the uh, destination, the network side where you really want to give the protection could simply drop all echo request packets based on the ICMP uh, number. 
so that you are not letting uh, the network that you want to give protection uh, to be vulnerable for such flooding based attacks okay so uh, these are some of the attacks you can prevent with the stateful firewall uh, any questions so far so let us continue with uh, firewall for some time okay so the next firewall is the application firewall so the application firewall unlike the packet filter and stateful firewall will look at uh, both the header as well as the data so basically the entire uh, packet is being looked at now so in that sense you could also process the data and see if it has some malicious code in it so that you don't let the data to be just forwarded and let it to be run at the uh, destination site or the source side whichever you want to uh, give protection and uh, make them to uh, uh, get uh, make them to go out of order so you basically will monitor everything and uh, also it's like a virus scanner so you also process the data and make sure there's no such virus code or any uh, code that should not be really allowed to be processed by a machine okay now in that sense also we can have two types of application firewall you can have what's called a proxy firewall and reverse proxy firewall so the difference lies in what kind of network you want to give protection so if an application firewall is trying to give protection for a network of clients from being attacked by an external server is called the proxy firewall so a scenario for that would be uh, like you're working from your home uh, by logging into an office computer which is like a client machine so you have a lot of client machines in, your, in each person's office and if you are trying to log in from outside uh, to those office machines then you need a firewall to make sure that uh, the office machines are really protected so uh, so the proxy firewall will try is trying to uh, give protection to client machines that's what basically I want to say which cannot handle much of processing so the proxy firewall uh, so you know you, have, you use all this VPN gateway processing and all those things so those, that's a firewall so uh, all the security authentication mechanism uh, is handled at the proxy firewall so they will authenticate the outside user uh, and the computer from which you are trying to communicate. So once the proxy firewall validates all the credentials of external user, it will let all the traffic to go to the office computer, uh, which by itself cannot do all these things. Uh, now the reverse proxy firewall is an application firewall that is trying to give protection for an internal network of servers that is uh, from being attacked by an external client. So that's the difference. So a proxy firewall is uh, protecting uh, a network of clients whereas a reverse proxy firewall is protecting a network of servers so uh, again you may wonder why servers also need protection can't they handle all the security issues uh, not all the security issues uh, especially if you are running say a database server and file server that are hosting say a web uh, say you are running a grocery store and you are hosting all your product information the product uh, cost and all those things now we haven't seen these things but if you have taken some data security class like web security uh, uh, class uh, there's something called cross-site security cross-site uh, request forgery sql injection attacks and so on that could be launched on database servers or uh, web servers uh, or even the buffer overflow attacks now using these attacks you could really change the contents of the database and uh, uh, so you could really change how much uh, a particular uh, grocery item will cost and then for say a certain portion of time or until the administrator notices that the cost has been changed everyone will be kind of buying uh, the item at that whatever the cost we have changed it to so uh, you really want to prevent any some malicious code from being executed on these servers so you will need a reverse proxy firewall that can monitor all this code 
and prevent any such malicious looking code to penetrate to the network and reach the servers. So that's the uh, uh, duty of the reverse proxy firewall. Okay. Now, uh, so, so far what you have seen are uh, firewalls that are run on dedicated computers. Now you may think where a personal firewall falls under. So a personal firewall is not really a firewall from the, from the definition point of view of what, how I defined a firewall because you are running a personal firewall on a personal computer on which you are running several other applications. You are, not, you are not running only the personal firewall code on your personal computer. You are running a lot of other applications. In that sense, a personal firewall is not really uh, kind of guaranteed to protect the computer because if your computer is, is uh, compromised using, uh, by one of those applications, then your personal firewall could also come under attack. So even though it is meant to give, uh, 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 meant to protect the computer, okay, it should not get compromised based on applications that are running on that computer. Okay, so that's why you cannot really believe only on the personal firewall. You have to uh, use the other firewalls in your network. You know, before uh, uh, in addition to installing a personal firewall on the, every office machine that you are trying to give some protection. Now uh, a personal firewall could do things uh, that are not done by these other firewalls in the sense that it could also do some kind of intrusion detection in the sense that uh, it could monitor all the activities that are uh, being executed on your computer, maintain a log of those activities and then it could run every day and uh, kind of uh, give you some alert messages that it noticed some uh, unusual activities for a certain day and time and so on. So uh, when I see intuition detection, I'm going to talk about host-based intuition detection system. And so these are loose terminology. So a personal firewall could function like a virus scanner, could function like an intuition detection system and so on. So the main thing you have to know is uh, it's different from the other firewalls, the classical traditional firewalls in the sense that it is run on a host machine on which you are running other applications whereas the other firewalls are running on dedicated computers. So that's what you have to know as the main difference between a personal firewall and the other firewalls. Okay, uh, so let me see. Okay, let us just finish this slide. So what firewalls can and cannot block? Now, a firewall alone cannot secure your environment in the sense that uh, a firewall will try to protect only from uh, the outcome, uh, uh, traffic that is coming from outside or it will try to protect what is going out of your network, okay? But it cannot protect the uh, machines in the network uh, from what is called internal threat like for example through disgruntled employees. So an employee who is not happy with that organization can bring some virus code on his say uh, what is called um, uh, a store, some storage device, a laptop or a pen drive or anything and uh, plug it to the computer inside the network and corrupt that computer. So in that way, if, if that happens, uh, a firewall cannot protect that computer, right? So uh, uh, in order to do that, that's why we need the next topic, which is, which is intrusion detection system. If some attack happens inside the network uh, that either bypasses the firewall or is beyond the control of the firewall, we need one more way of trying to uh, protect the network and that's where the intrusion detection systems come. Now uh, is a firewall, uh, one firewall just like we saw three categories of firewalls, packet filter firewall followed by stateful and then the proxy firewall. Is that, is that sufficient to operate only one single firewall or we need multiple uh, sequence of firewalls? The answer is it's better to have a layered approach uh, of firewalls. You keep all these three firewalls in a sequence like this, the packet filter firewall followed by a stateful firewall followed by the proxy firewall and then followed by a personal firewall running on that particular host machine. The reason is this, uh, as we saw the things that can be captured increases as we proceed from the packet filter to the proxy firewall. 
so a packet filter firewall cannot capture a lot of attack packets belonging to different attack categories but it can process packets quickly so it can process a lot of packets and uh, it can decide whether to allow them further and drop or drop them so as i said it may let the packets belonging to a session hijacking attack to enter but it can be captured now by a state full firewall okay and if and both these cannot look at the code but a proxy firewall can look at the code but to look at the code and the entire packet a proxy firewall will take a lot of time so we want to limit the number of packets reaching a proxy firewall so that's why you let fewer packets to reach a proxy firewall but it can spend more time per packet as a packet filter firewall will spend less time per packet and it will be able to process a lot of packets and if a packet manages to penetrate pass through all these firewalls and reaches a host machine that's where you could have the end user configure the user specific requirements uh, on this personal firewall so for example the user may not want to see information coming from a specific website and so on uh, then you could configure such things on a personal firewall rather than on all these network based firewalls okay and also uh, uh, the final thing is uh, the rules that you set for the firewalls need to be constantly updated so you cannot have one set of rules that are set up uh, when you install the firewall and then just uh, leave it as it is as you get to know more about the different attack packets attack sources and the type of traffic that attacks can or, uh, generate you have to modify the firewall rules in order to be able to detect such attacks uh so that's why that's where the intrusion detection systems also come so a firewall will initially let some packet to go through but when an intrusion detection system detects that this is an attack uh, traffic uh, you have to come back and update the firewall rules okay now let me see i think uh, we may need a break um, okay so let me take five more minutes and finish the firewall traffic and we'll take a short break after that uh, I'll just save this video because